Because celebrity culture is false intimacy. You think you know these people, but you really don't. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Justin Wells. Welcome to Author Stories. Find archives of all the shows at HankGarner.com, and while you're there, never miss an episode by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube. It's free on all platforms. As we get into today's show, I'd like to tell you guys about some incredible new releases that I know you're going to love. The brand new book from Nathan Heistad, Rift, The Resistance, Book One. They've watched us for centuries through the rift. They prepared. Invasion is inevitable. The Earth fleet has known of the Watchers for years, unwilling to share the knowledge with humanity. Now it might be too late. Hidden away from the fleet, one man is creating a new colony ship destined for the other side of the rift, but he's missing a few pieces. Three other people have varied paths to get there. Ace goes from the streets of Earth to the fleet training facility on the moon. Flint, an ex-fleet pilot, must decide if a job is worth his life. And Wren, imprisoned for a secret project years ago, is given hope as an unlikely ally, whispers words of escape in her ear. Their journeys lead to Councilman Jarden Fairbanks, who knows of the impending invasion and has prepared. All they can do is wait for the rift to open once again and see what's on the other side. Rift joins an ensemble cast facing immeasurable obstacles. If you enjoy space battles, prison breaks, androids, and aliens, buried under a shroud of mystery, this book is for you. Try it today. A fresh new fiction adventure from the author of the best-selling Survivor series. Rift, The Resistance Book 1. Now available. There's a link in the show notes. Also from our friend Rick Partlow, Recon, A War of the Knife. Tyler Callis had a life most people would kill for. He killed to escape it. Tyler is the pampered heir of a high-level corporate council executive, groomed from birth to take a seat beside her as a member of the ruling class of the Commonwealth Society. But the bloody war with the alien Tani has hit close to home and Tyler wants to join the military, something his powerful mother won't allow. Desperate to escape her control, Tyler changes his identity to Randall Monroe, a product of the poverty-stricken underground, and enlists in the Marines. There he flourishes becoming a member of an elite force recon unit and striking deep behind enemy lines. But when his platoon is assigned to take back the colony on Demeter, from the Tani, the mission falls apart. Most of his comrades are killed, and Monroe is wounded, separated from his unit and left for dead on an enemy-occupied world. With no other choice, he organizes the civilian colonists into a resistance movement and begins fighting against the occupation, with limited supplies and no support. As the situation becomes more and more desperate, what began as a high-tech interstellar conflict will become a war to the knife. Recon, A War to the Knife by Rick Partlow. There's a link to it in the show notes. Book 3 of the Saga of the Iron Dragon. The conclusion of the epic series that began with the dream of the Iron Dragon. 9th century Iceland, three explorers from the far future have a daunting mission. To save humanity, they must build a craft capable of reaching the stars. The Voyage of the Iron Dragon is the concluding book in the Iron Dragon Trilogy. The Iron Dragon Trilogy is being produced as part of the phenomenally successful Saga of the Iron Dragon Kickstarter, which raised over $10,000. Meticulously researched and packed with action, the dream of the Iron Dragon is a must for sci-fi and alternate history fans. Also, Book 2, The Dawn of the Iron Dragon, is available now from Audible.com. There's a link to it in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Justin Wells on the show with me today. Justin is a documentary filmmaker. Uh, He is also an author of a brand new book called How to Film Truth, the story of documentary film as a spiritual journey. Uh, And also, if you check out Justin's IMDb page, uh, he has... Uh, been all over some, uh, some movies that uh, you guys, uh, have seen and, and probably are fans of. So, uh, uh, I'm excited to talk with you today. Justin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. 
Well, Justin, we begin each show with the same question, and uh, that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, that's a great question. I actually talk about this in the introduction to my little book. Um, you know, I, I this book is about documenting life, documenting reality. And I can remember the first moment was really when my grandfather um, came with a camera, a little DSLR camera, Minolta, and showed up after, you know, lunch one day, having lunch and said, hey, let's let's try this out, you know, and we went out and I took my first photograph. And then I remember, you know, it was in the days of film. And so I had to get it processed and waiting for it to come back. And ever since then, I was sort of hooked and, uh, you know, wanting to wanting to document reality in some way, whether it's in the written form um, or whether it's uh, photographically. Nice. I, I, uh, that question, uh, I added a uh, storyteller to it uh, kind of early in the show uh, because, you know, you, you you quickly learn um, that not everyone approaches uh, their art or storytelling in general the same way. And a lot of times one expression uh, is kind of a gateway drug for another. Uh, and, you know, things that you, you quickly learn that uh, that one f- that, that people rarely kind of stick to one form of expression their whole life and that that we are creative people in general. And uh, a, a lot of times we just need to uh, you know, use a different media, a different form to tell different stories. Uh, do, you, do you feel like that uh, is true? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I I really wanted to write this book after I had taken a class at Art Center College of Design where I got my second master's degree. Um, I took a class on documentary film and we were doing these weekly assignments where we were having to sort of delve into something personal and I was noticing that there was this really kind of, well, people in the class were dealing with very personal issues because of the assignments in the class, you know. And I recently uh, had been taking a memoir writing class just for fun, you know, kind of on the side. Yeah. And in this memoir writing class, it was a, it was so fascinating because the same process was happening. As people started to delve into their personal lives, into their memories, into their past – with a good teacher who who kept saying, go deeper, go deeper, go deeper. It got to the point where the instructor had to say, listen, I want you guys to know that I'm not a licensed therapist. So, you know, I'm going to bring you back to the page. But that's the kind of stuff that was coming up in this process of exploring your life. You, you said you were pursuing your second master's. What What did you decide to, uh, uh, to pursue uh, college-wise in the beginning? Well, I, in undergrad, I was a communications major, but then I got a master's in philosophy from Cal State Long Beach, um, it, because sort of on the side while I was still working. And then I actually, this was, I misspoke because it was actually my third master's. <laughs> and then, I, then I went <laughs> that to, you lose uh, track. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I went to uh, Fuller Theological Seminary and studied religion and art. And then I went to Art Center College of Design to do an MFA in film. What was your uh, what was your draw to uh, philosophy? Well, it was sort of um, I just start. I was so bored. I was working at Panavision International, a movie camera place, um, breaking into the film industry at the time, and I, I just wanted some intellectual stimulation. And I started taking classes at UCLA Extension at night. You know, and I took philosophy of religion, I took existentialism, I took mythology, Jungian psychology. You know, all this stuff. And one of the instructors said, wow, we've been seeing you a lot. And he goes, I think you probably have enough prerequisites. You could probably just get a master's degree. And he goes, <laughs> you know, I was like, wow. And he goes, I teach at Cal State Long Beach. Why don't you just do that? And for some reason, I, that seemed like a good idea to me. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I went um, while I was still working and uh, just kind of on the side, plugged away at my little uh, master's in philosophy. But it, it sort of set me on a course for uh, – Thinking deeper, um, also academia and just, you know, um, interacting with the the greater minds throughout history, which, you know, I think is a very, very important part of being an artist is um, I, I think it's Werner Herzog, who's, who's one of my favorite filmmakers. 
says that if you want to become a filmmaker, then you should read, 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 you know? And I, I think that's, that's true. That's, that's what I did is, um, you know, I just thought, you know what, especially now that I'm in documentaries, um, I've interacted with, you know, some of the best minds of all time. And so I don't really feel intimidated if I'm interviewing an academic, if I'm interviewing someone, uh, that that's a heavyweight in their field, I feel like I can have a conversation with them because, you know, I've, I've been having conversations quote unquote with, with, uh, great thinkers, you know, ever since, uh, ever since I started this process. Right. Um, I, I uh, I find it interesting that you uh, were taking class on, on memoir uh, writing. Do you do you feel there's an intersection uh, between uh, the the ability to to tell that personal story uh, that the way memoir uh, does it can tell a, a personal story like like no other form uh, and documentary filmmaking? Do you feel like there's an intersection between those? Yeah, that's what I was discovering. I, I mean, I. I I wasn't necessarily going into this memoir class thinking that, but it, that's how it turned out. Right. See, I, I started to, <clears throat> I've been going to the Sundance Film Festival. Um, I think this is going to be my 15th year next week. Um, and we, I'm a part of an organization that does, um, that does um, dialogue between people of faith and filmmakers. Okay. And it's been happening for a long time. And it's always a very, very interesting conversation because people are interacting with the, you know, the content of the films. Now, I sort of found that there was this <clears throat> at the festival, there was a, a kind of a I call it a documentary encounter between the subjects, the filmmaker and the audience. And I found that the more personal and the more sort of um uh, honest, the, uh, filmmakers and the subjects were able to be, um, the more sort of healing emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually healing this whole process became. And, you know, I feel like it's, it's the same exact sort of therapeutic process that happens when people are writing memoir. Uh, yeah, I can, I can totally see that. Um, that's uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, you said you studied um, at Fuller. Um, uh, what what was the course again? Um, art and um, it's and, religion and art. Or okay, religion and art. And art. Okay, yeah. okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, the as you were saying that uh, the wheels started turning, and I, I remember uh, a book that I read in the early nineties. Um, it was by Frankie Schaefer. Uh, it was uh, Francis mm -hmm. Schaefer's the, the great theologian, his son. Uh, and it, the book was called "Addicted to Mediocrity," mm -hmm. and uh, that that book has has stuck with me these you know <clears throat> almost thirty years. And uh, you know his his point was that uh, that. Uh, people of faith should have a uh, should be making the best art um, if if they truly believe they are connected to the creator of the universe. We should be creative people, and that uh, and that the things that we settle for because uh, faith has become um, uh, homogenized and has become uh, a you know, another thing to sell, um, that, that we, we kind of reduce art to the least common denominator. And, and when we do that, we come up with really, um, subpar, crappy, uh, stuff that, that people of faith get made fun of for. And, um, so I, I'm really interested in the, um, at Fuller, what's, what's the attitude about the intersection of art, uh, and religion? Well, um, see, I think that this this Sundance um, experience with taking students, um, not just seminary students, not just seminary students, but um, also um, theology students. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so basically, the Sundance Film Festival is very gritty, very sort of real and honest. And. Um, the more that the students were seeing this kind of uh, more realistic, more kind of nuanced um, 
depiction of, of reality, taking into account the complexities of life and not trying to oversimplify things, the more they started to mirror that um, in their own art, you know, in their own films. In fact, some of the students went on to get into the uh, Sundance Film Festival and uh, and influence the festival in their own ways. <clears throat> so um, it was a real kind of uh, interesting to see that. Um, but see, what I started to notice was that the um, the documentaries that I was seeing at Sundance were kind of lining up with um, traditional forms of truth telling, you know forms of truth telling that exist in culture and in religion um, and have a very sort of long and rich history. And if you, if you, um, if you understand uh, how these uh, truth telling rituals work, um, they kind of played into the documentaries I was seeing. So the categories that I started to see lining up were confession, you know, confession in religion, confession as a literary genre, you know, the confessions of St. Augustine, all the way up to confessional, Novels like um, Dostoevsky or something. Testimony, which is about encouraging the tribe, you know, or seeking justice in the court system. Uh, celebration, which is about remembering what's important as a as a group, you know, as a society. Lament, which is about um, not forgetting uh, the tragic, you know, never to be repeated, like the Holocaust Memorial or, you know, the Vietnam Memorial. You know, memorial art is a very long tradition. And then what I'm just calling the poetic. So <clears throat> these different categories, what I started to think was, you know what? I think that filmmakers would be interested in how to understand these these long histories and these long traditions of truth telling rituals and tap into that in their filmmaking. Um, but also, I feel like religious people, if they knew that that the the concerns of artists are very similar to the concerns of of people of faith in terms of the questions they're asking, um, <clears throat> they can engage with this as well. Do you, do you feel like that we are in a, uh, a, a sort of a golden age for, uh, documentaries right now? Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it seems like there are more documentaries, um, at least accessible to most of us, uh, now than ever before, uh, you know, when, when Netflix and Amazon prime and, and, uh, delivery mechanisms like them have whole categories around them and 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 some of them are very very good and some of them are very very bad and you know from a mm -hmm. quality standpoint but but there's uh, you know we that like this is is kind of part of the culture now uh you know you you actually have conversations with people you know about hey did you see this documentary uh you know and there's some real breakout successes over the last couple of years um how do you feel about the state of of documentary filmmaking now, as opposed to maybe uh, uh, other times we've been in our culture. Oh, it's definitely a golden age right now. I mean, I think just in terms of box office numbers, um, you know, I, I did a study <clears throat> over the summer. I started to notice that, and everybody was kind of talking about this, that there were several films breaking the, excuse me, the uh, all time uh, box office numbers, you know, top 20. Um, Mr. Rogers, the uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor, uh, RBG, um, and Three Identical Strangers <clears throat> were doing very well at the box office. Um, but also, you know, these streaming platforms are really providing, not only are people watching more on Netflix and on Hulu and on Amazon, um, but they're also funding them, you know. <clears throat> They need content, and so they are commissioning uh, better filmmakers to uh, go out and and make documentaries. Um, when, as a, a documentary filmmaker, how do you know when an idea will be uh, will, will resonate with people, or um, can a uh, can a filmmaker make any idea resonate with people? What what is the the key to uh, to figuring out what that good idea is? Well, let me just give you an example of a film that's out right now um, that's on Hulu that uh, when I saw it, I said, I said, this is the the best example of confessional documentary I have I've ever seen. And it's a film called Minding the Gap. <clears throat> and uh, it's by Bing Lu. And I just found out that uh, I think yesterday that it's nominated for Academy Award. 
which is which is crazy because it's a small personal sleeper film and you know it beat out won't you be my neighbor and a, and a few other sort of major documentaries um in the academy award process <clears throat> but this is basically this kid bing lu starting you know at 16 15 years old was filming uh his his buddy's you know skateboard um and it, it seems like it's a skateboard documentary at first <clears throat> and it's very beautiful and very poetic but as it goes on he starts to probe and talk behind the camera and just have candid conversations with his subjects which are really just his buddies you know and he starts to really just kind of prod at this sort of underlying um thing in the dark that nobody wants to talk about and that's the fact that there's sort of domestic violence from fathers and stepfathers in in all of their past you know <clears throat> and the thing when w- with that kind of uh material that kind of a subject is that it's hard to talk about as a society you know it's something that is very uncomfortable and very personal and this film becomes kind of a mediator kind of a way for us as a group to talk about something difficult like that and have it not be about ourselves. <clears throat> so the subjects are really kind of performing a gift for the rest of us by making themselves vulnerable and making this kind of a public conversation. So it's kind of crazy. Um, the fact that <clears throat> you wonder what is it that will stop these cycles of violence from continuing because we know that oftentimes if if one generation has it it'll get passed down to the next generation <clears throat> and uh you get the sense after watching this movie that maybe for these individual characters they seem like they're better off just in terms of self-knowledge you don't know how they're going to turn out in life but there's a sense that, that this is a, a step in the right direction you know, using the art, using the medium to shine a light on this. And there's just a sense that when there's a light shining on it, it can't quite fester as much because these things sort of grow in the dark. And so I think it's, a, I mean, <clears throat> if we can pay attention to what these artists are saying through these films, I think it's going to, it's very healing for society. That's a great point. Um, you know, another thing that documentary, um, can do is uh the 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 form can be very persuasive um we've all seen um uh, conversations on social media that uh that devolve into uh just kind of our basis nature and uh you know i've rarely seen a conversation on social media actually change someone's mind on something um usually it just you know gets down to name calling and and just kind of falls apart or or blows up um but documentary is is kind of this weird thing that can actually change people's minds um we've seen it in in some uh kind of high profile documentaries where we see the story of someone and uh, and people actually change the way they feel about maybe capital punishment or uh, war or uh, in, in any number of things. Um, it, it's this really fantastic medium for kind of getting past uh, the intellectual barriers that we put up maybe. Um, what is it about this form that allows you as a filmmaker uh, to to kind of get so close to someone's heart and to, to actually make them think differently? Well, I I've, I've been thinking about this a lot because I have noticed such a uh, um, vitriolic sort of um, toxic environment that exists on a lot of our social media and our public rhetoric, and there's a sense in which that medium sort of lends itself to argumentation, and it lends itself to snap judgments, and it it lends itself to uh, tribalism, you know, <clears throat> whereas I think just the fact like a documentary often takes a lot longer to make and it takes longer to watch, you know, you, you're, when I was watching Minding the Gap, you know, you, you're spending 90 minutes with these, these characters. And when, when the character says something a little shocking towards the end, 
where, you know, having to do with, um, you know, his being asking him whether or not he worries about his own son and his own girlfriend. And if there's any, any sense of, of, uh, of conflict there, you know, <clears throat> he admits something that if he would to, were to say that on Twitter, he would have been vilified and he would have been lynched, you know, by a mob, but by a Twitter mob, you know, um, but that's I was seeing the exact opposite of that in that theater. I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the theater and it was nothing but empathy, you know, because we saw his journey. We saw where he came from. We saw his struggles you know, with alcohol. We saw, um, you know, the fact that he has a job that doesn't work, that he couldn't get his GED. Um, you know, all of these things that sort of contribute to who he is. So he becomes a more complex, you know, whole person. Um, as opposed to that sort of <clears throat> very flat, very narrow uh, sense of what a person is on the other side of social media, you know. So I don't know. I, I feel like it's kind of documentary film, if we embrace it, is kind of an antidote to that sort of really toxic pub- public rhetoric that we have. Um, you mentioned seeing that uh, that documentary in the in a theater uh is is that how we should be watching documentary? And uh, uh, what do you feel about uh, even though uh, you know the streaming services and things have have opened up the medium to a lot of us? Uh, do you feel like that that is the the best delivery mechanism for this sort of art? Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'll tell you, I'm really glad that these streaming services exist. Okay, you know, I, because I think that it's. It's it's providing funding. It's providing opportunity. Um, <clears throat> but I still think that uh, in an in a environment where we have more and more and more distractions just because we, we all have a phone in our pocket, um, it is, it's very important for us to spend some time um, in contemplation or, you know, working through a subject in a, in a more methodical way without the constant distractions from our phones. So however we choose to do it, I do think it's healthy um, to watch a, a movie without being distracted. You know, that's part of, I think that's part of the power of it. And that's kind of how it's an antidote to our, uh, to, to our attention span problems that we have. I mean, I think like in, in a society where because of the, our technology, it's very rare where we get to have a a space, a contemplative space to be alone with our own thoughts. I mean, even if you go to the museum these days, you're still probably going to check your phone, you know, but a theater is like one of the few places left in our society where you can't pull out your phone because it's a dark room, you know? So it, I, I think that, you know, we as human beings, we need contemplative space. You know, it's part of, it's what we need for our mental health. And, You know, it just so happens that this medium um, is one of the few places left in our society that allows uh, for contemplative space. Well, uh, you know, even some museums encourage you to take out your phone and and have these kind of guided walkthroughs and, you know, get more information on our app here. Um, (laughs) And, you know, this there are more and more things are are are, uh, not only vying for our attention, but encouraging uh, Mm -hmm. us to. To have this kind of hybrid experience, which uh, which is weird, you know. Yeah, uh, it, there's something about watching a movie in a theater, any sort of film, mm-hmm. that um, uh, if you if you really look at it, it's it's kind of an inconvenient uh, thing to do these days. You mm-hmm. because you're you're in a dark room, you're you you should be separated from your technology. I, you know, you still see the glow up screens every now and then as someone pops out their phone. Um, but you know, it's a designated time. You have to be there on time when the film starts. You can't just, you know, queue it up whenever you're ready. Um, but there, but we still go to the theater. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, we, we still see films with, with record box office. People are still going to see movies. Um, is there something communal, um, uh, that, that goes on in the theater when you're watching a film with a group of people, um, you know, aside from, you know, the, the great point that you pulled out about the, the contemplative space, but mm-hmm. is there something communal that happens when we watch something together? Oh, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I am um, always sort of wishing for 
uh, for communal space in our society because we tend to design it out. You know, I think that oftentimes the most enjoyable part for me about going to a movie is the conversation over coffee or a glass of wine after the movie, you know? And, you know, I, it's like, I love to go to the little independent theater here, the Lemley theater in Pasadena because of that reason, because we, we, there's a coffee shop next door, you know, as opposed to, um, <clears throat> it's sort of a, a mall type megaplex place where everyone sort of scatters and wants to get to their car quick because they got to validate their parking, you know? Right. So, so I, yeah, I, I think that people want community they want conversation surrounding art. You know, art really is just a sort of a grand conversation. And the more that we can facilitate that, the more rewarding it is, I think. And that's why I kind of like, I prefer film festival culture over celebrity culture, you know, because celebrity yeah. culture is, is a false intimacy. You think you know these people, you, you're familiar with their voice, you're familiar with their facial expressions, but you really don't, you know, and I know that because I work celebrity adjacent when I... When I meet a, a celebrity, I realize this guy doesn't know me from Adam. You know, I, I don't have a relationship <laughs> with him. You know, I've had a camera in his face multiple times. And he still doesn't know me. Yeah. Right. You know, it, but but film festival culture is meeting the artists, you know, meeting the subjects if it's documentary and kind of coming together um, as a community, you know. So and, and the, the crazy thing is that there's film festivals everywhere. You could go to a film festival almost every week of the year if you wanted to. And it doesn't matter what part of the country you're you're in. I mean, uh, they're happening all the time. So, you know, I think the more we can foster that kind of communal engagement with art, uh, the better it is for us as as um, as a healthy civil society. Well, at, as writers, um, you know, you, you spend so much time on a book and uh, you, you come up with a great idea and you. And you work through the twists and the turns and the emotional um, hooks and and all of this stuff. And it's a, a very solitary experience in a lot of cases. Um, and then when the thing is all done, you share it with your editor and you go through, you know, a couple of rounds of edits and all that. Um, and uh, either a publisher or you, you self-publish, but you, there's usually a few other people involved. And, um, you know, you're. You kind of had this tiny group that are familiar with the story and then you release it to the world and, and you sit and you wait, um, you know, to, to, to start getting, uh, you know, feedback from people, um, in, in a film, uh, uh, the film culture and the, the, uh, like, like you're talking about, um, where you, you take this thing that you've made and then you share it with a group and you can get immediate feedback. Um, what is that feeling like? And, um, is that different from writing for you? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> well, it's interesting because this is my first, you know, foray into the writing, to the writing world. Um, but I feel like they're kind of similar. They're very similar because it, you know, filmmaking is actually, I mean, the kind of filmmaking that I do as opposed to the Hollywood stuff, which is more of a, more of a, um, you know, having an army of resources and being kind of part of the whole process. Um, the, uh, you know, personal filmmaking or macro filmmaking, um, <clears throat> is kind of a lonely process or it can be, you know, collecting material, talking to people. I mean, you know, I, I, I learned so much just by doing the interviews. I always, I find it amazing that, um, somebody like I interviewed Michael Dukakis, you know, for my urban <laughs> planning documentary. And I thought, you know, why is he saying yes to me? You know, he, he's an urban planner at uh, USC or at UCLA. <clears throat> and uh, I'm thinking this is amazing. Like, you know, the fact that I get to have these conversations with people. But then you're kind of like sharing that journey. You're going out and you're researching and you're discovering things and you're putting things to connect together, making connections. And then you get the chance to show it to people. And I, I remember you know, one of the first times showing one of my films to a, a group of friends. And I just thought, this is this is amazing, you know, because I I want to share this with you, you know. So I feel like it's the same way with the book because, <clears throat> you know, I was sitting in a coffee shop reading, uh, you know, sending copies to my editor, uh, you know, writing, you know, get, getting it all together. And then once the book is out there and it sort of just comes back to you, 
in in small ways. You know, people say, oh, you know, I I saw your book and people, you know, contacted me on Twitter or Facebook or something. And old college friends, you know, pop out of the woodwork and say, oh, I heard about (laughs) you. You know, it's just I feel like if you can put the time in and you you can kind of give that gift to the world, it comes back to you in very uh, sort of organic and magical ways. So what was the the impetus to write this book? Um, you, you're uh, you've been working in film. You, you're kind of all over the place. What, what was it that got you that, that brought this idea to you that you felt like needed to be shared? Well, I think it was the Sundance Film Festival. It was just the fact that I was meeting so many filmmakers, documentary specifically, that were making really, really powerful films. And it's it's not something <clears throat> again. It's like the the difference between celebrity culture and and the art of film. They're not necessarily the same thing. They can be, but um, I just really sort of fell in love with the art of filmmaking and the the personal nature of that art. You know, and I I sort of uh, I wanted to come up with a way of ta- a vocabulary for talking about nonfiction film specifically. And especially, you know, in in the fiction film world, there is a lot of uh, talk in screenwriting books, for example, of, you know, how to tap into the religious imagination in order to make a better film. You know, so the writer's journey, for example, is a book about how to use Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which is kind of amalgamation of different mythologies to make a better screenplay, you know, well, and that there's something deep inside us that that hero's journey uh, taps into, but it doesn't necessarily translate straight over to documentary film. It can, if you're making a narrative documentary, but, um, I think in terms of these truth telling rituals, it's kind of doing the same thing. It's looking at what are these sort of deep human needs that we have that are present in our religious rituals and our cultural rituals that the art is sort of participating in or analogous to, you know, so that's why I think like the the confession thing, you know, the need to be known. We have this need to tell someone our deepest secrets. It doesn't work b- alone in a vacuum. You know, you can't go into therapy and just talk to the room. There needs to be another person there, you know. Right. And 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 that's what these subjects were doing in these documentaries. They because someone was listening, they started to use the camera as a confessional and say things to the camera that they had never even admitted to themselves. You know, it's it's super powerful. That's so crazy. It's so crazy. Um, in in writing the book, did you uh, how how was how was the process different for you than than documentary filmmaking? Um, was did you uh, kind of start the same way that you would a, a documentary kind of uh, gathering information and talking to people? Uh, or I guess the uh, where did it diverge from you and did the creative mm-hmm. process become different? Well, it's it started because uh, there was a buddy of mine uh, who I went to Fuller with, uh, Elijah Davidson, and he had written a book called uh, How to Talk to a Movie. And it would, this was just basically, here's what film language is, here's what editing is, here's what narrative is, here's what montage is, etc. And they wanted to make this into a series. And I was having coffee with him one day and he said, you should contribute, you know. And I thought, yeah. You know, like I've been really, really thinking about documentary, you know, <clears throat> but I knew I wanted to understand documentary better, but I didn't know exactly what I was going to discover about it. You know, so the process of research was, first of all, just going through the history of documentary film, you know, and, and reading different, uh, you know, s- scholars, film, film study scholars and stuff that were talking about it coupled with my own experience and then, you know, having the process of having a really good editor, series editor like that to walk me through so I could bounce things off of him. Does this make sense to you? Does this make sense to you? And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I just sort of am in love with the, the idea of research, you know, just going out there and researching and, and gaining that, that in greater understanding just for myself, you know, and then that becomes sort of the tip of the iceberg for what eventually becomes your, your little book. You know, so I, I don't know. I, I think I, I just like the whole process. 
Well, the book is How to Film Truth. Uh, it's available everywhere now. Um, Justin, what do you hope that the average reader takes away from this? Maybe who someone who is, uh, would not call themselves a film snob or, or, or someone who, who had uh, kind of a, a, an eye into the inner workings of the film industry or documentary. Um, th- this book really is for everyone. Uh, but what do you hope people take away from it? Well, I would say um, if you can – if you can really appreciate um, all the different ways that documentary films are providing the service for the rest of us, you know, um, if you understand what confession is and what confession does and why we have a need for confession, you're going to be able to engage with confessional documentaries. You know, if you can understand what lament is, what memorial art is, then when you see a lament film, you'll be able to really appreciate it and engage with it. So, so I think that's, that, that would be my main goal is let's look at all these really, really amazing documentaries out there because we're in a golden age for documentary and there's some really powerful stuff that you probably haven't heard of, you know, and there's no better way, um, in my opinion, to spend an evening than really, really engaging with one of these powerful uh, sort of spiritual films. And so that would be my goal is, is a, a greater awareness, appreciation of everything going on out there. Excellent. Uh, we're going to put a link to the book in the show notes. Um, Justin, if people are just learning about you and the work that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online, learn more about you and kind of dig into all the stuff that you do? Sure. Yeah. On my website, justinwellsfilms.com, that's kind of the landing sp- uh, place for everything. Um, and then uh, at uh, one J Wells on Twitter. Um, if, if you, if people are wanting to try their hand at making a, a, a documentary, we're going to put up a little, uh, space on the website for people to send in their films. If you wanted to make a confessional doc, if you wanted to make a testimonial doc or a celebratory doc, um, we're going to put a, a space up on the website for uh, people to send them in so that you can see what, uh, what that's like. That's fantastic. Uh, Justin, I, I love what you're doing. Um, I wish you much success on the book and, and uh, the filmmaking. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, thank you so much. A revolutionary quantum teleportation device promises to bring humanity one step closer to the stars until it fails spectacularly. The Translocator from M.G. Heron, available now on audible.com. Go to mgheron.com slash ASP. Archaeologist Eliana Fisk is ripped from Earth while the whole world watches. She lands on a strange new world inhabited by a lost tribe of ancient Mayans, meeting them, getting first-hand exposure to age-old customs and rituals. It seems like an archaeologist's dream. But what if the rituals have a darker meaning? What if the God these people pray to is no God at all? And how in the world will she ever get back home? Thus begins a pulse-pounding race against time that hurls Eliana into a great unknown, revealing ancient technologies and marvelous mysteries more outlandish than she ever imagined. The Translocator is an action-packed sci-fi thriller perfect for fans of Stargate, the Atlantis Gene, and other archaeology-inspired science fiction adventures. Pick it up today. Go to mgheron.com slash ASP. That's mgheron.com slash ASP. The Translocator by M.G. Heron. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Hello, young one. What ghoulish tale of horror shall we explore tonight? Shall we watch The Creep Show? The Nightmare on Elm Street? Child of the night, give me your answer. Which one would mom kill us for watching? Said Buddy. Dad grinned and his eyes grew wide. Which do you think, child of the jackal? The omen! 
And we might have time for Omen, too, if we hurry. She'll be home by eleven. I'll be back. Buddy ran to his room. He stripped down to his Yoda underwear and fished in the closet. Two minutes later, he snuck back into the living room wearing his skeleton costume from last Halloween. He crept up behind his dad, who was cueing the movie. But David Rittermeyer was too clever for that. He spun around at the last moment and bared fang teeth torn from paper plates, drawing a yip of surprise and a cry of, No fair! Daddy kicked off his Reeboks, plopped his smelly gym socks on the coffee table, another thing that Mom would hate, and killed the lights. The scary intro music began. The screen showed the silhouette of a boy, about Buddy's age. His shadow was a long, creepy cross. The Antichrist, the son of the devil. Born of a jackal on a night of astrological portent, destined to bring about the end times and the final battle of good versus evil. Buddy sipped sun-kissed and scooted up next to his dad. As the movie got scarier, he slipped an arm through his father's and cupped his big bicep. Buddy could feel his father's pulse. Dads get scared, too. They flinched together, shouted together, pointed at the screen and covered their faces together. Buddy pressed his eyes to Daddy's shoulder just before the on-screen maid shouted, It's all for you, Damien! and dove from the roof, hanging herself. Buddy knew which parts he was old enough to watch and which parts he wasn't. He trusted his dad to let him know when to look again. Occasionally, his dad tricked him into peeking too soon, but that was part of the fun. They kicked their feet at the screen and shouted, Look up! Look up! Oh, idiot! Don't get yourself killed! At the climax, the hero of the movie, Mr. Thorne, discovered a birthmark of three sixes on his son's head and dragged the little antichrist to the altar of the church, determined to spear his son with holy daggers and end evil forever. After it was over, the Rittermeyer men sat silently through the credits. David put an arm around his son and ran his fingers through Buddy's hair. He wasn't searching for devil marks. He knew there weren't any. And Buddy was certain there were no daggers in his father's hand, either. Those things were just make-believe. Real fathers and sons don't do bad things to each other. They were queuing up Omen 2 when the power went out. No, Buddy whined. Not on movie night. Daddy went to the window. It's the whole block. Sorry, Damien. How about, hmm, scary blackout? Go get the Ouija board out of the guest room closet. Cool. And candles. Buddy found the Ouija board hidden under old clothes. When he shut the sliding door again, the sight of a monster startled him and he let out an involuntary, huh, sound. It was his own skeleton-bodied reflection in the mirrored closet door. He stared at it. He liked the effect of moonlight on his cheeks. Spectral, haunted, his eyes big and white. He clacked his teeth at himself, picturing his own grinning skull under his child's flesh, and gave an evil laugh. He was answered by a scream. A woman's scream. High-pitched and far away. One of the neighbors? Buddy dropped the Ouija board into a patch of moonlight and sat with it. What's going on? He whispered, his fingers on the heart-shaped wood planchette. 